Well, welcome back as we discuss the book of Titus. And in previous sessions, we've discussed the need to know truth by separating facts from speculation and allowing that to determine our course and our decisions. Think about this example for a second with truth in mind. What's the best way to lose weight? I know, I know, I know, I know. I get it, I get it. Stick with me for a second, though, and answer the question. What's the best way to lose weight? Do you avoid carbs? Or what about simple carbs versus complex carbs? Do you avoid fats? What about healthy fats? Should you avoid sugar altogether? Do you only get your fitness through running and or cardio workouts? Or is it better to only lift weights and use that as your cardio? But if you're lifting weight, should you lift heavy for less repetitions or lighter for more repetitions? You get where I'm going, right? It can be confusing because the amount of experts out there that will tell you that this is the diet that's guaranteed to give you the body that you desire, or this is how you grow the muscles that you want. There's so much information that you can really truly get lost. And at the end of the day, there needs to be a focus. What are your goals? What's your purpose? And what are you trying to accomplish with your weight loss? That will inform your decision. And that's really the first question that you have to answer to set yourself on the right path to achieve those goals. What is your goal? And it's no different in the Christian life. As we discussed in previous lesson, there's a ton of information out there about Christian living. But what is the goal? You know, Jesus answered that for us in the Sermon on the Mountain. Peter repeated it in his letter as well, both of them quoting Leviticus, where they said, Be holy, for I am holy. That is the goal of the Christian life. But... That brings another question. What does it mean to be holy? Well, in Leviticus, the word holy is the Hebrew word kadash, or pertaining to being unique and pure in the sense of superior moral quality, something that's sacred, something that's consecrated. In Peter, the word is the Greek word hagios, which simply means pure. And in Matthew's version of Christ's Sermon on the Mount, it's the word teleos, which specifically means morally perfect. If holiness is the goal for us to set our course by, then how do we do such a thing? It's exactly where we actually turn our attention to in the book of Titus today. Paul's writing as a mentor to Titus, and he's just warned him of the propensity for false teaching within Crete. But he moves right from that section by saying, but as for you, speaking to Titus, now the instruction is solely going to be for Titus. Paul shares with Titus that those who teach falsely in chapter 1 are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. But he switches his focus then to Titus and instructs him to teach what accords with sound doctrine. Everything that will follow in the rest of this chapter are subpoints to this main point. And the essential point that Paul is making is this. Right doctrine leads to right living. From this point, Paul is going to instruct Titus as he is instructing those within the church on how they should interact with each other. The way Christians interact with one another inside the church is of utmost importance. In the following chapter, in chapter 3, he'll address the way that Christians should relate to those outside of the church, but the focus here is on inter-Christian relationships. There are three groups that he's going to address. Older men and women, younger men and women, and slaves. All of the characteristics that flow from one single thing, holding correct doctrine. What must be noted as Paul's instructing the man he's left in charge of these churches is a transition that he makes when he's 
talking to Titus about how he should instruct younger men. He's specifically instructing them how to act, but he tells Titus to make sure that he models the behavior. As leaders of our families, and especially if we're in a position of leadership within the church, we have to be the models by which our family and our people take their direction. But how we lead is just as important. Are we leading through sound doctrine? If not, and we must. Much of the focus you'll see to the older men and women comes with an instruction to train as the older and presumably wiser generation are interacting with the younger generation. They have to have a heart of a leader and a mentor. For the younger generation, Paul's instructions deal specifically with self-control. How these two generations interact must be around sound doctrine, training in sound doctrine, and self-control based upon that sound doctrine, and that sound doctrine is specifically grace. Our relationships within the church will determine the type of relationships that we have with those outside of the church. And if we cannot get it right, the people who share a common doctrine, how can we ever expect to share that doctrine, that urgent truth, with those outside the church. Paul's instructions also pertain to those in the social class of slaves during this time. Even they were to live their life and model their behavior as someone that it's marked by and directed by sound doctrine. And that's why it's so imperative. As Paul moves through the characteristics that should be exemplified by these different age groups and these different social classes, they're all consistent with the urgent truth that he so fervently told Titus needed to be defended earlier in the letter. But he doubles down and he reminds Titus again of the urgent truth in verses 11 through 15, where he writes, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, he says, exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no one disregard you. And it's here that we must be continually reminded we live in light of this sound doctrine. We must remember that Paul's major concern is living in light of this urgent truth, of this sound doctrine, of this gospel, because right doctrine leads to right living. But let's also remember the words of Paul to Titus as well to model this correct behavior for those that we are given to lead. Because if we don't lead them through sound doctrine, Somebody will, and that will be on us. May we understand and take to heart the massive responsibility that we have to lead and to lead well, especially when it comes to interacting with those inside the church. And next week, we'll get to the way that we relate to those outside the church and hope to portray to them this urgent truth and the salvation of their souls.